They love to use Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. And this is major. Listen up. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer who I who live. See? Martin Luther told us we don't live. We're dead. We're passive things. They love to use this verse. But Christ who lives in me. Uh, again, you gotta, you got to define the words. When they say Christ who lives in me, when they talk about Christ in us, in us in Christ, listen, that's by faith. We aren't really literally in Christ and Christ in us. That's by faith. We only experience a work of Christ as if in us. But remember, the double speak. One of their big deals that they talk about over and over and over and over again is this whole thing about Martin Luther's alien righteousness. What is that? All righteousness is apart from us and outside of us. One of the technical terms for this doctrine itself is the centrality of the objective gospel outside of us. Okay? <clears throat> Again, that's another example of doublespeak. Uh, on the one hand, it's, it's Luther's alien righteousness. There's no righteousness inside us. So when they say Christ in us, how do they interpret that? you got to know. Turn your mind on. Stop turning your mind off and listening to these guys and sucking up everything they say. Stop it, please. I'm begging you. Okay? Um, so, in me, to, so anyway. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. They love this verse. But what's it talking about? Paul, the Apostle Paul, is talking about half the Gospel. Now there's two parts to the true Gospel. And I'm going to do my first session by having a presentation of the true Biblical Gospel. How do you like that? Awesome. That's where I'm going to start out. There's two parts to the true gospel. Being saved is not a mental assent to the death, burial, and resurrection in Christ. The Protestant gospel is. It's a mere mental assent. And then when you're born again, you now have the ability to see but sanctification is something that is done to you and not by you. There's no real new birth. Okay? They deny the new birth in the way the Bible explains it. Okay? We're not literally new creatures. Well, yeah, we're new creatures insofar as our ability to perceive reality only. And when they talk about passing from death to life, that all has to do with the ability to see reality. Now a lot of hurting people who come to me who are being destroyed, their lives are being destroyed by the contemporary uh, 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 biblical movement, time and time and time and time and time and time again, they come to me and they say, Paul, I keep asking questions. Paul, they're almost in tears. Oh, I want answers. All I want answers. And I keep asking question after question after question. And they either won't answer it or they just sit there and look at me. Or, or they say, well, we'll get to that later. And then we never do. Paul, what's going on? Well, here's what's going on. They don't think you have a grasp of reality. They know that they see reality totally different from what you do. You don't have a grasp of their reality. You don't have a grasp of their reality. So yeah, they're just going to sit there and look at you. Okay, hey, I've gotten, I was challenged to debate 
some reformed yahoo from from Costa Rica. He, you know, and I said, yeah, fine, I'll debate you. We'll do it on the radio program. But you know what? The first thing we're going to talk about is the fact that you and I interpret reality totally differently. No, 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 no. They wouldn't go for that. And I'm like, well, then all bets are off, pal. Forget it. Okay? Because what they will do, they'll engage in these debates, and they will speak from this redemptive point of, point of reality, okay, and you end up looking like a total idiot, because they just stay the course, and basically they're debating you, but they're totally ignoring your view of reality, as if it's not valid. And it works, okay? You know what? Here's the bottom line. A seven-year-old, my granddaughter, in Puerto Rico, John MacArthur Jr. wouldn't have a prayer of winning a, an online debate against her. But you know why? Because she can read. And all she's got to do is go to debate to the debate and read from the Calvin Institutes and make MacArthur explain what he's saying. Okay? That's, that's all you got to do to win a debate with these yahoos. And that's why they won't debate me and they wouldn't debate my granddaughter, my, what, nine-year-old granddaughter. Okay? Uh, because if you can read from the Calvin Institutes and you've got all of the places marked, they can only explain so much of what Calvin really said in there. Okay. Will you, um, on this verse in Galatians 2.20, mm -hmm. you've talked about this before. Right. Is this a justification verse or a sanctification verse? It's half of the gospel. This is half of the gospel. <clears throat> I'm not going to get into it, but this is half of the gospel. As I was saying, the true gospel is just not in a mental scent to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. No. True salvation is following Jesus Christ in death and resurrection. Paul is only talking about the death part of the new birth. When the Holy Spirit comes in you, okay, that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and two things happen to you. You're literally, you literally die and you're literally resurrected. Okay? Of course Paul's saying, it's no longer I who live ac according to justification. Because the old Paul was dead. Okay? This is only talking about half of the, uh, the resurrection. It's not talking about the resurrection part. It's only talking about the death part. How do we know? I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. That's half of the gospel. Paul is not addressing the resurrection part at all. When you use Galatians, okay, when you use Galatians 2.20 as a sanctification verse, as they do, okay, because they fuse justification and sanctification, whether wittingly or, un uh, wittingly or unwittingly, you are preaching an egregious false gospel. Okay? I have been, this only has to do with the death of the old you that is no longer under the law. I am no longer I who live. Look, this is Romans 6. <clears throat> this is, you can't take Galatians 2.20 2, and isolate it and put your own spin on it. It's got to be interpreted in light of Romans 6 and also Romans 8. And for that matter, Romans 7 too. Okay? Um, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God. Okay? Uh, salvation, justification is by what? Faith alone. Okay? Who loved me and gave himself for me. Again, look. 
the beginning of the verse, I'm crucified with Christ, who loved me and gave himself for me. Well, Jesus was resurrected too, wasn't he, Paul? Not by himself, but by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Jesus' Christ part in justification was the death part. And that's the only why Paul is only talking about uh, in other places, in Christ, in other places he talks about Christ. Now, Susan asks a question. Paul, isn't this talking about justification and not sanctification? Yes. It's talking about no longer being under the law of sin and death. It's talking about, it's, it's half, it's the half of Romans 6.14. The half that you aren't anymore under law. Okay? One of the things I'm going to talk about in my presentation is, dear Christian, you must interpret your Bible grammatically, and you must interpret every verse, whether it is a justification verse or a sanctification verse. Protestantism uh, uh, interprets every verse as a justification verse because their salvation is progressive. Okay? And I'm not going to get into all the double speak of already, not yet. Okay? So, <clears throat> let's answer Susan's question, shall we? In context, anybody game? Next verse. Could it be plainer? I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Is the point not obvious? But Paul! But Paul! That's Paul's whole point. Jesus kept the law for us. That's still righteousness through the law! It doesn't matter who keeps it. And why would Christ keep the law for a dead person? Okay? You're no longer under it. The law, the, the law of uh, uh, sin and death? Why would Christ fulfill that? What good, what good does the fulfillment of the law and sin and death do for a dead person? She goes on. Sin is what creates that need for Christ. So if you're no longer under the sin of uh, the uh, 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 law, sin and death, you you do have no need for Christ. If we are good and okay and all right, again we, okay. If we are good and okay and all right, was she talking about lost people or saved people? Yes. Okay? But here's the problem. I, I got this asked this question just this week. Paul, how can they read a verse that plainly says what it says and outright contradict it? Because they don't interpret the real, reality the same way you do. They interpret the reality through the eisegesis of uh, redemption. Okay? Romans, either Romans 14, 15, or 15, 14. That would be 15, 14. I do believe. Okay? Paul says, I'm confident that you yourselves full of goodness. are full of goodness. Filled with all knowledge. So this statement by her right here is just a direct contradiction to the plain sense of Scripture. Well, now, um, and how we live doesn't matter. Okay, and how we live doesn't really matter then really. Why do we need Christ? And of course, how we live, you got to interpret that. You mean how we see. 
uh, what Christ is doing in our life and not anything we do. It, their own little phrase. It's not what we do, it's what Christ has done. And that gets into the whole double imputation thing, and I won't get down that rabbit track. We need Him. We need Him. Okay, and of course we need Christ. But again, in what capacity and in what regard is she saying that we need Him? Answer, ongoing salvation. Always as a Savior. Right. As a Savior. Okay? Paul David Tripp says it on page 27 of How People Change. That even an approach, an effort on your own part to change your thinking is, is a technique that excludes Christ as Savior. He says it. 